Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Covey Lecture Series. My name is Jennifer Kelly. I'm a recent PhD grad uh, from the Biotechnology Program here at Brock University under the supervision of Dr. Debbie Ingalls and Gary Pickering. And I'm currently working as a postdoctoral fellow in Debbie Ingalls lab. And I'm here to introduce her today. Debbie attained her PhD from McMaster University in biochemistry in 1995. After a brief stint in the biotech industry where she did her postdoctoral fellowship and then worked as a senior scientist in research and development, she joined Brock in 1999 in the Department of Biological Sciences and started teaching in the Enology and Viticulture program as well as in biochemistry. In 2008, she became the director of Covey and still holds that position today. Debbie's research program first focused on issues of ice wine fermentation, but has expanded over the years to other wine styles, such as sparkling and apacimento wines, with a focus on yeast impact in those wines, tannin management in red wines, methoxypyrazine remediation, and grapevine cold hardiness, and the biochemical changes occurring during winter dormancy, and more recently, on diagnostics for grapevine diseases. Debbie comes from a grape and wine background, being a second generation grape grower herself, and her brother used to own a winery here in Niagara that he sold just a few years ago. Today, Debbie is going to talk about a locally isolated yeast that she has been investigating for a number of years now, and she will explore with you its application to a number of different wine styles. So with that, I'll hand you the floor. Thank you, Jen. Thanks, everyone. It's uh, great to be on uh, this side of the lecture and giving a lecture. Uh, normally, I'm doing the introduction, so it's been a few years since I've had the chance to, uh, to give a talk. So I'm going to walk you through uh, today um, our characterization of a locally isolated yeast. And we actually started this research about 15 years ago. And at that time, there was very little information on the microflora um, and the diversity of yeast on the, the skins of ice wine grapes and how that might be impacting the aroma and flavor of ice wines produced here in the Niagara region in Ontario, Canada. So we embarked on a project to isolate yeast from Riesling and Vidal uh, uh, ice wine grapes and characterize their fermentation performance. So this work started with a postdoctoral fellow, uh, Dr. Jeanne Nurgle, and uh, it was spearheaded by Gary Pickering and, and myself, who were collaborators on this grant. So the first step, we needed to isolate uh, a number of, of yeasts from uh, Vidal and Riesling ice wine grapes. And this was uh, quite a large daunting task because we needed to first um, uh, see if we could plate the, and get any yeast to grow just from the juice expressed from, uh, from the grapes themselves. And then as their populations uh, increased during the course of fermentation, uh, we were able to take samples through the fermentation and also plate them out. Uh, so as colonies started to grow up throughout the course of the fermentation, uh, we noted uh, different colonies for their shapes, their colors. Uh, we looked at them under the microscope, looked at uh, the cell morphology, and we coded all of these different um, uh, isolates. Then we had the fun task of trying to identify these isolates. So we grouped them according to their cell morphology, and then we would pick colonies and go through various identification tests. And when we first started this, uh, we weren't using molecular tests as extensively as we are now for yeast identification. So we started the identification using biochemical-based tests uh, from a company called uh, Biomuria, and we used these API identification tests and supplemented uh, the IDs with some additional biochemical uh, tests that we did in the lab. Later on, we verified those IDs using uh, molecular-based testing, and I'm going to walk you through that uh, in the next few slides. So uh, from the Riesling ice wine grapes, and I'm going to focus on that because uh, the, the yeast from the Riesling are where we identified this unique yeast that we further characterized. So from the Riesling, we really focused on five different uh, isolates. And through the API identification, we came up with five different uh, yeast that we identified. So there was a Candida 
uh, datilla, Candida pulcherima, Cloacra piculata. Cloacra piculata is really the most dominant yeast that you see on grapes anywhere in the world, so that wasn't surprising. Uh, a Cryptococcus uh, laurentii and Rhodotorula uh, glutinous. And Rhodotorula uh, um, really isn't able to support a fermentation, so we weren't too interested in, in that yeast for further fermentation uh, analysis. So throughout the course of uh, the spontaneous fermentation with the ice wine uh, grapes, we were able to follow these populations uh, of yeast. And uh, what we were most interested in uh, was this green, sort of limey green uh, uh, yeast that at the time we had identified as Candida datilla. Uh, it had some, uh, it was quite a, uh, it appeared to have good growth. We thought it was um, uh, a, a good, could potentially be a good fermenter. Uh, but in order for us to verify that, we would have to inoculate individual fermentations with the various yeasts and be able to characterize their fermentation performance. We could see a few of the yeast died off within the first few days of fermentation. Uh, some lasted a few more weeks, so they could contribute overall to the fermentation. Uh, but uh, uh, we needed to do a little more work to see what the interactions and the dynamics of each of these yeasts were going to be. But before we did that, we wanted to continue to focus on the ID identification of the yeast. So in this column here is the original identification of the various uh, isolates. We moved on to uh, looking at some uh, advanced molecular methods for doing the ID. So uh, we were starting to focus in on the 5.8 srRNA ITS region of, uh, of yeast. And we did an amplification of that gene region using the polymerase chain reaction, or PCR, and then uh, carried out a restriction fragment link polymorphism analysis. So basically, we cut up that segment of DNA with different restriction enzymes and looked at the patterns of um, uh, DNA pieces that resulted. And when we did that analysis, we found that Candida datilla wasn't really Candida datilla. It was coming up as either Saccharomyces bianus or Saccharomyces pastorianus. We weren't able to distinguish between those two yeasts based on the, the fragment patterns, uh, but it gave us a very different ID from what the API original um, uh, test gave us. Uh, the Candida pulcherima was identified as Mexicalia pulcherima, which is just uh, another form of, of uh, Candida pulcherima, so this is really the, the same yeast. The Cleopera piculata also came up as Cleopera piculata, or Hansenius forayubarum, again the same yeast, uh, just a, a budding versus a sporulating form of the yeast. Uh, same with the Candida and the Mexicalia. The Cryptococcus laurentii uh, identified as two different Cryptococcus strains, but again, we weren't really interested in these yeasts because they're, they're not really fermentative. Um, and then the Rotatorula glutinous came back as Rotatorula glutinous, um, so we knew that ID was uh, correct. We took it a step further to see if we could differentiate between the Bianus and the Pastorianus yeast by actually sequencing at the nucleotide level uh, this uh, DNA region of the 5.8 srRNA ITS region. And through sequencing uh, the segment, we still weren't able to further differentiate between the yeast species. They were just too similar um, in that region. And the other yeast, uh, again, came up as, as what we had identified previously. Eventually, uh, we uh, further um, sequenced a couple of additional genes in the yeast genome, a beta 2 helin gene and a COX-2 gene. Um, and really, we were focusing just on being able to differentiate between the Saccharomyces pastorianus or Viana strain. And from that last test, we were able to identify the strain as a Saccharomyces bianus yeast. 
So all of this work uh, was uh, uh, not done by just one person, and it was done over, over a number of years. Uh, Jeanne Nurgle uh, started that original identification with the API kits. Then we moved into uh, some fourth year uh, thesis students to take us to the next level. So Jamie Kwai did the um, PCR RFLP analysis, and then Cherie Saude uh, did the, the further DNA sequencing. Uh, for the sequencing of the beta tubulin and COX2 genes, that was carried out by Eileen Bay, another postdoc that came into the lab, as well as uh, Jen Kelly, when we finally got the identification um, confirmed uh, for that yeast. So, uh, nowadays, uh, we would be able to jump right to uh, these latter two uh, tests uh, and get IDs much faster, but uh, back 15 years ago, it took us a little bit uh, longer to, uh, to confirm that. So the next step on this journey was to look at the fermentation performance uh, of these isolates uh, from the Riesling ice line grapes. And this work was carried out by a fourth year student, Jamie Kwai. And we picked uh, the three fermentative yeasts, the Clepera piculata, the um, Candida uh, pulcherima, and uh, the Saccharomyces vianus. And we compared the fermentative performance to a commercial yeast uh, used in ice line, K1B1116. So uh, just to give you a sense of uh, the matrix that we were testing, we got some Riesling ice wine juice and it was uh, upwards of 40 bricks. So uh, it's a fairly concentrated uh, juice. Uh, this is a, a typical breakdown of, of ice wine juice. We've got some acidity uh, for Riesling at nine grams per liter, tartaric acid, pH uh, about 3.27, lots of nitrogen for the yeast, over 600 uh, milligrams of assimilable nitrogen, uh, very little acetic acid in the starting juice, a little bit of glycerol, and uh, really no ethanol to speak of um, uh, uh, in the initial juice. So we took this juice and separately, uh, we inoculated uh, the juice with each one of these yeasts. And I should uh, point out to you that we sterile filtered the juice, so we knew no other yeast were present, um, uh, going to be present other than what we were introducing. And we found that uh, the Vianus yeast performed fairly similarly uh, to uh, the commercial yeast. So I was quite excited about that, that result. Uh, it was able to produce a similar amount of ethanol in the wine. And we had stopped the fermentations about 27 days in, so this wasn't a really prolonged ferment, and they were testing at about 8% uh, ethanol at that time. But while I was doing this research, I was very interested in understanding acetic acid production during ice wine fermentation, and I was working with the industry on that issue. So, of course, I wanted to look at uh, the difference in acetic acid production by the various yeasts. So, again, for K1, it produced um, about 1.7 grams per liter of acetic acid, a typical level that we would find in ice wine. Uh, but the Vianus yeast produced much lower amounts. However, when we looked at how much sugar each yeast was consuming, they all consumed a little bit um, different level of sugar. And of course, acetic acid is a byproduct of sugar. So I wanted to uh, confirm these results by taking that acetic acid and normalizing it to the amount of total sugar that the yeast consumed. And when we did that, we got basically the same uh, relationship. Uh, the K1 commercial yeast produced the highest amount of acetic acid <laughs> per sugar consumed, whereas the Vianus yeast produced significantly less acetic acid. Uh, this was a, a really interesting finding in terms of commercial application of this yeast. It's a low producer of acetic acid. So based on uh, uh, these results, we wanted to focus future experiments on this Saccharomyces vianus uh, isolate. And we wanted to do some additional uh, comparative fermentations to the commercial yeast, K1V1116, which was that low produce, um, and see if the, if the S. Vianus yeast uh, still showed in different ice wine matrices low production of acetic acid. So we took this Vianus yeast and further studied it in some Videl um, uh, ice wine juice. So we have lots of Videl ice wine juice around uh, and uh, uh, decided to uh, further characterize uh, the yeast. 
And this was work carried out by another fourth year student, Caitlin Height. So with this experiment, not only did I want to compare the fermentative capacity of this yeast in ice wine, but I also wanted to see what it would do in just a regular table wine fermentation. So we took the ice wine juice, which was testing at 38.2 bricks, and basically diluted it <laughs> uh, to also test it at uh, 20 bricks. So we have these two juices, 38 bricks juice and 20 bricks juice, and we inoculated both juices with either the commercial yeast K1 or our isolate CN1 or uh, the Saccharomyces cyanus uh, to see how uh, the fermentation performance uh, would compare. So uh, when we took a look at the, I'll, I'll start with the 20 bricks juice. So 20 bricks juice had uh, almost 200 grams per liter <laughs> of sugar present in it. And we found that both yeast basically fermented to dryness uh, with the uh, Bianis yeast taking a couple more days uh, to consume all of the sugar compared to K1. But basically within two weeks, the fermentations had, had gone to dryness. When we looked at the more concentrated ice wine juice, we started to see that um, the K1 commercial yeast, it was consuming uh, upwards of uh, uh, about 220 plus grams per liter of sugar. But the Bianis yeast, it wasn't as strong a fermenter. It was basically stopping the fermentation and plateauing um, after it consumed less sugar. So although it was able to ferment ice wine juice, it wasn't able to consume quite as much sugar. And that would lead to uh, a slightly lower ethanol production for that yeast. So when we took a look at the comparison um, of the yeast for um, ethanol production, we see that the amount of ethanol produced in the 20 bricks uh, juice was very similar between uh, the K1 commercial yeast and the S. Bianis isolate. But when we take a look at ice wine, we see that again, the Bianis yeast is only able to produce about 8.5% ethanol, whereas the commercial yeast was upwards of 12% uh, volume per volume ethanol. Again, having interest in acetic acid production, we followed the profile of acetic acid generation throughout the fermentation. So here we've got acetic acid on this scale and just days of the ferment on the bottom scale. And we can see for uh, the commercial yeast, they produce the majority of the acetic acid in the first week. That's a very typical response during ice wine fermentation. And then the acetic acid uh, just basically plateaus off after that. We got a similar response with the Bianis, but they weren't producing as much acetic acid. But keep in mind, they also didn't consume as much sugar. So I can't make full analysis just yet until we normalize to how much sugar they consumed. But for the, the 20 bricks fermentation, we can see, again, the commercial yeast, it produces most of the acetic acid within the first four to five days, and then it plateaus off. Whereas something unique was happening with the Bianis yeast. It was producing a little bit of acetic acid in the first day, but then the level started to drop off in the wine. So it produced some, and then it seemed to be taking that acetic acid up and consuming the acetic acid, right? So just keep that in mind as we continue through the characterization. So when we compare final acetic acid values uh, in the final wines, we see in the dilute juice fermentations, the 20 bricks fermentations, uh, the Bianis produced a very small amount of acetic acid in comparison uh, to the commercial yeast. And similarly, uh, in the ice wine, uh, the commercial yeast produced a lot more than the Bianis. But again, uh, we haven't normalized uh, uh, these graphs to the amount of sugar consumed. So when I normalize to how much sugar was consumed, we basically get the, the same um, uh, relationship. Uh, the Bianis yeast, whether it's in the 20 bricks juice or whether it's in the ice wine juice, is producing significantly less acetic acid. In the table wine juice, it was a 90% drop in acetic acid production. In the ice wine juice, it was a 30% drop. These are fairly significant numbers uh, that, again, I was intrigued about. We're continuing to uh, characterize this as Saccharomyces vianus yeast uh, because I'm, I'm wanting to understand 
what's going on within the yeast? Why is it producing less acetic acid? Is it consuming that acetic acid and converting it into other compounds? What's happening to that acetic acid uh, within the cell? I don't have the answers to that, but uh, my current grad student, Robert Alley, and, uh, and I are, are working through this um, uh, biochemical characterization of the yeast. But what I wanted to highlight to everybody is yet in uh, an additional ice wine juice, we're seeing that uh, the, the Bianis yeast, which is this orange yeast, uh, <coughs> continues to grow throughout the ice wine fermentation. Uh, it consumes sugar, but it doesn't consume as much sugar as the commercial yeast, uh, as we've seen in the past. It produces acetic acid, but it produces much less acetic acid compared to the commercial yeast, uh, K1, B1116. And even when we look at acetic acid as a function of sugar consumed instead of a function of time, we still see for every um, le level of sugar that's consumed, we still have less acetic acid generated by the Saccharomyces vianus yeast in comparison uh, to the commercial yeast. And again, uh, the Bianis yeast is producing about 30% less acetic acid during these fermentations in comparison to the, to the commercial yeast. However, there's limitations of this yeast in ice wine. Uh, it's not as strong a fermenter as commercial yeast, and so it's only producing about 8 to 9% ethanol routinely. Uh, the yeast is um, a significantly lower producer of acetic acid after normalizing for the sugar consumed. So I started thinking, would there be other applications of the Saccharomyces vianus isolate to other wine styles? So a few years ago, we started working with the industry on the Passamento wines. And this is where fruit is dried off the vine and concentrated. The sugar isn't concentrated to the same degree as ice wine. It's not at 40 bricks, but it's up at 27, 28 bricks and still is osmotically stressful to the yeast. So we thought there may be an application for the Bianis isolate to this wine style. Also, knowing that um, from that earlier ice wine uh, uh, result, in the 20 bricks juice, sorry, not the ice wine, but in the deadly uh, bricks juice, this yeast is able to consume acetic acid. And so I got to thinking, maybe uh, there's an application here for grapes that have a high starting level of acetic acid. And if this yeast was able to consume acetic acid through the fermentation, um, maybe that could be beneficial uh, overall uh, for, for the wines being produced. So in the second half of my talk, I'm gonna focus in on these other wine styles. So we're gonna take a look at the application of the Saccharomyces vianus yeast to a Passamento wines to sour rod infected grapes uh, for red wine production. And then a project that I started working on with uh, Belinda Kemp uh, with sour rod infected fruit for sparkling wine production. And uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that as we uh, continue on. So first for the Apasimento wines, we, I started working with the industry back in 2011 on Apasimento wine production as a a new wine style uh, for the region. So Apasamento wines are uh, wines that are made from grapes that have been further ripened off the vine post harvest uh, to concentrate the fruit and the sugars. So we, in our study, were looking at red wines made using this Apasamento technique. So we were producing full body red wines that were really higher in alcohol, upwards of 14% volume per volume uh, alcohol. And the challenges to overcome in a Passamento wine uh, were this um, uh, higher Grix level of the juice, 28 Grix, and trying to ferment a wine to dryness, so not leaving any residual sugar. Uh, this level of sugar, starting sugar in, in the juice, does put osmotic stress on yeast. It makes the fermentations a little more difficult. Also, there are issues with oxidation faults in this style of wine. Uh, so from the literature, when you, you look at a Passamento wines, just through the drying process itself, uh, the grapes can build up oxidation compounds, higher levels of acetic acid, um, acid aldehyde that translate through into the wines. Uh, the wines often also 
uh, have uh, uh, impact from ethyl acetate and ester from acetic acid and ethanol. Further, through the drying process, botrytis can sometimes uh, develop on the fruit, and this can also lead to some of these um, uh, oxidation issues uh, and higher VA in the juice that gets translated through into the wine. So uh, a couple of years after starting this project, Jen Kelly uh, came into the lab and started characterizing the Saccharomyces biennis yeast, which we had called CN1 by this point, uh, for Passamento uh, winemaking. And if anyone's wondering why we called it CN1, it was the first isolate uh, from our list of, of five, and it was isolated by the postdoc uh, at the time, Jeanne Nurgle. So CN are Jeanne's uh, initials, and one for the, for the first isolate uh, that we were looking at. So we wanted to answer what are the upper sugar limits uh, of juice that this yeast uh, could ferment to dryness. And how does it perform compared to Saccharomyces cerevisiae? And the, the gold standard yeast used in a passamental wine production is EC1118. So in ice wine, we were comparing this yeast performance to K1B1116, because that's the, the yeast I was studying for ice wine production. In a passamental, we switched to another really strong fermenter, uh, EC1118. And we're looking at the fermentation uh, kinetics, the oxidation compounds in the final wine, as well as the sensory profile uh, uh, of the wine. But at the end of the day, we also wanted to know whether there was uh, consumer appeal for these wines. So we also carried out uh, a consumer preference uh, uh, study. So for the fermentation dynamics, uh, we can see that uh, uh, for grapes that were, uh, the grapes started, sorry, at 21.5 grips, and we dried them up to 24 and a half, 26, and 27 and a half grips. And then we carried out fermentations with either Saccharomyces cerevisiae in blue or the Saccharomyces biannis yeast um, in red. And as we carried out these fermentations, we found that at 21 and a half, 24 and a half, and 26 grips, fermentations, the Viannis yeast was very comparable to the commercial yeast. When we got up to the 27 and a half bricks fermentations, it took a couple more days for the ferment to, <laughs> to dryness uh, using uh, the, Bi the Viannis yeast, which is cut off here, sorry, uh, but the red is Viannis, uh, in comparison uh, to the commercial yeast, but it did still go to dryness. When we took a look at some of these oxidation metabolites, uh, acetic acid and ethyl acetate, we found that for the CN1 yeast, always the production was significantly less than what we were seeing for the commercial yeast. And this also held true, true uh, for the uh, ethyl acetate. But we were, again, interested in what was happening with acetic acid production during the course of fermentation. Uh, so Jen also did some time course analysis of acetic acid uh, as a function of uh, the fermentation day and compared the dynamics in the low bricks, the 24 and a half bricks, 26, all the way up to 27 and a half bricks. And hopefully what you see in these graphs is a very different dynamic for uh, the Bianis yeast in how it produces acetic acid in comparison uh, to the commercial yeast. So the commercial yeast in blue, always within the first few days, we get a buildup of acetic acid and then it starts to plateau off. For the Bianis yeast, they make some acetic acid and then the levels start to drop off and then it plateaus again. We see this in the lower bricks, in the 24 and a half, in the 26, and even in the 27 and a half bricks juice. So uh, this isn't a, a measurement phenomenon. This is a real phenomenon that's happening within this yeast. And you'll remember back when I was looking at the 20 bricks, the Dell juice uh, in the first, uh, in that earlier trial, we saw this similar scenario. So the Saccharomyces biannis uh, isolate starts to consume acetic acid that it generates in the fermentation. So we see that it starts to produce and release acetic acid out into the wine. It then reabsorbs that acetic acid, takes it back into the cell, and then eventually produces a little bit more during the latter part of the fermentation. 
So we can see throughout the fermentation, the end amount of acetic acid here is less than the peak amount uh, during the course of the, uh, the fermentation. So again, carrying on with the sensory analysis of the mines, I'm not gonna go into detail of this. I did present this in detail in my 2016 lecture, which is still posted. So if you'd like to see the analysis uh, of those wines in detail, uh, please uh, take a look at, at that lecture. Uh, but in summary, the Saccharomyces biennis yeast um, shifted the sensory profile in the Apasimeno wines uh, towards increased black fruit, um, aroma, and flavor. And it reduced the sourness and the astringency in the wines in comparison to the Saccharomyces cerevisiae yeast. So again, we were quite intrigued by these results. Um, that led us to the final part of this uh, study to look at consumer preference of wines fermented by the, the different yeasts. And so we carried out a consumer preference um, a study with CompuSense and found that when we compared the Apasimeno wine fermented with the Saccharomyces cerevisiae, the commercial yeast gold standard, in comparison to our Saccharomyces Mayanis isolate, there was no significant difference in the liking scores by the consumers, meaning they liked both wines basically to the same degree. They didn't have a preference of one yeast over the other. So another way to look at this is that they liked the CN1 fermented wines as much as they liked the EC1118 fermented uh, wines. And keep in mind, these wines were lower in acetic acid and lower in ethyl acetate which are our concerns for uh, this wine style. So the next application for the Saccharomyces biennis yeast was to look at uh, how it fermented fruit that came in with a high level of acetic acid in the starting fruit. Uh, so this was work that um, uh, we were intrigued and interested in, uh, especially in our region, because some years we have growing seasons where we have a lot of sour rot that can build up in some of our varieties. Uh, notoriously, Pinot Noir, uh, also known as the heartbreak grape, uh, can break down uh, rapidly just before uh, harvest. Uh, and this is a lot of work that my colleague, Wendy McFadden-Smith, has carried out uh, over the years. Um, so we wanted to see uh, how the Bianis yeast would perform using Pinot Noir that had sour rot uh, in the fruit. So I was able to get my hands on some grapes that uh, had so much sour rot in them, uh, the fruit had been rejected in the field. So nobody else was going to take this fruit. Uh, and when we analyzed that fruit, it had 0.45 grams per liter of acetic acid in the starting fruit. Typically, grapes are rejected at the wineries if they have between 0.2 to 0.24 grams per liter of acetic acid. This had basically double that amount of starting acetic acid. Uh, so I had a fourth year student, uh, Stephanie Van Dyke, that was uh, uh, looking for a project. We had access to this Pinot Noir fruit and uh, she came on board with Belinda and I to uh, carry out a, a, a research, eight month research project in our lab. And we compared the ability of this Saccharomyces biennis yeast uh, to ferment the sour rotted fruit in comparison to EC1118. And when we take a look at the fermentation dynamics uh, uh, between the two yeasts, they're uh, very similar to each other. The fermentations uh, completed and went to dryness uh, within four to five days. Um, we then followed the acetic acid, uh, what we thought would be production uh, maybe some consumption during the course of the fermentation. And we found that both yeasts actually consumed acetic acid during the course of the fermentation. However, uh, the Saccharomyces biennis, yeast, the one in red here, consumed significantly more acetic acid in comparison to the EC1118. In fact, it dropped the acetic acid from the starting juice of 0.45 grams per liter to only 0.07 grams per liter in the final wine, reducing that acetic acid 85% from the starting juice level to what was in um, uh, the finished wine. So this was uh, 
quite an intriguing result. I will say uh, I wasn't expecting the drop to be that significant, uh, but I knew we had a significant application here uh, for uh, sour rot uh, fruit. And a, a couple of years later, uh, or the, the year later, uh, Belinda Kemp was working on a sparkling wine project and very interested in the impact of sour rot uh, in um, grapes that are gonna, going to be used for sour, or sorry, for sparkling wine production. And what the impact would be, not just on acetic acid, but on some other unique flavor compounds uh, that can result in wine from sour rotted fruit. I'm not going to let the cat out of the bag on any of that. Uh, Belinda is uh, going to be doing a talk on this topic uh, in a few weeks. So I would encourage you to come back and see her talk uh, to learn about uh, these uh, additional um, uh, compounds uh, that uh, uh, can result from sour rotted fruit. But the question that I was interested in and what I'm going to focus on today is can the Saccharomyces vianus isolate ferment the very acidic juice used in sparkling wine production and can it reduce acetic acid in those acidic juices if they're infected with different levels of sour rot. So uh, we set up a, a fermentation trial with a, a grad student of ours, uh, Xiao Li. And uh, again, when we take a look at uh, the matrix of the juices, um, sorry, I should explain, we took sour rot infected fruit and we pressed out the juice from that fruit. And then we blended different volumes of that sour rot uh, uh, juice into the clean juice um, uh, resulting from, uh, from the grapes. So we had different sour rot infection rates um, or um, uh, impact rates of 0% sour rot juice uh, up to 10% volume per volume of sour rot juice, 20, 30, up to 40% volume of the, of the sour rot juice. You can see the bricks are fairly normal for sparkling production between 17 and a half to 18 bricks. pH is quite acidic, it's only about a, a pH of three. Uh, the TA between 12 to, to 13 grams per liter. Uh, yeast assimilable nitrogen, 150. Interesting, it does start to go down uh, with the more sour rot um, uh, volume of juice uh, there, which is likely indicative that the other organisms were consuming some of the nitrogen in that sour rot fruit. But uh, what we were happy to see with this design is that the, the more sour rot fruit we included in the juice, the higher the amount of starting acetic acid resulted uh, in the juice. And I have that visualized in, in the second slide here. So we can see with increasing amounts of sour rot included in the fruit, we have an increasing amount of acetic acid in the starting juice. And so in the most concentrated uh, treatment, the 40% uh, treatment, we had just over 0.25 grams per liter of acetic acid in the juice. So that's getting up to that, that upper limit that wineries will accept grapes at. We carried out the fermentations and compared the fermentations uh, between uh, the CN1 yeast and the EC1118. And EC1118, again, it's, it's really the gold standard yeast uh, used in sparkling wine production. Uh, what we found, again, the Bianis yeast, it lags behind the fermentations about four to five days um, uh, to go to dryness in comparison uh, to the EC1118 but they all went down uh, basically uh, to dryness. But what was really intriguing uh, with this yeast was the impact on the acetic acid levels uh, in the, uh, the wines that resulted. So if we take a look here, the, the light uh, red bars or pink bars are the initial acetic acid in the juice. The dark pink bars the red bars are the acetic acid in the wine. And what we see when there was no sour rot present, basically the Bionis yeast didn't really add any acetic acid, uh, further acetic acid to the juice. It just stayed at the same level. Um, sorry, in the wine, it just stayed at the same level as it was in the juice. But as the acetic acid increased in the juice, the yeast was consuming that acetic acid. 
and we got a, a very large drop in acetic acid from 0.25 grams per liter uh, in the initial juice down to 0.05 grams per liter in the final wine. Uh, so that's an 80% drop in acetic acid from the juice to the final wine using the CN1 yeast. It's a very different story from what we saw for the EC111A. For the EC111A, in the, um, uh, low, the treatments with less sour rot, we saw the EC111A adding some acetic acid. These aren't large amounts of acetic acid, but it is adding some acetic acid into these wines. And then as the sour rot increased, we saw um, uh, a little bit less acetic acid being added into those final wines from ec 1 a And they probably consumed a little bit of that acetic acid as we saw in that um, heavily sour rotted Pinot Noir uh, fruit up at that 0.45 gram per liter. We know ec 1 a can consume acetic acid, uh, but at these levels, it's not consuming near to the degree as what we see for the CN1 yeast. So what are our next steps going forward? Our next steps are to produce an active dry yeast so that we can carry out some commercial trials. And so I'm happy to report that uh, those dehydration trials to make an ADY yeast or an active dry yeast are currently ongoing with Lamond uh, to see if we can get a, a, a dry yeast preparation that will make it much easier to carry out commercial wine fermentations on a much larger volume scale in a commercial uh, winery uh, setting. Right now we have to build these cultures up uh, from a plate culture. Uh, it takes a few days to build that culture up to a high enough cell concentration to then inoculate it. Uh, into a fermentation. So if we had it in a re, uh, dehydrated form, we could just rehydrate the yeast like we do a typical uh, commercial yeast and add it into the fermentation and follow its dynamics. So uh, in summary then, uh, we isolated a fermenting yeast from Riesling ice wine grapes with potential for wine production with a regional uh, signature uh, style. The yeast was identified as a strain of Saccharomyces vianus, and we call this strain CN1. A main distinguishing characteristic of the yeast isolate, the CN1, is that it produces low acetic acid and low ethyl acetate. We also found that it can consume acetic acid from the starting juice, and so it may have application for grape varieties that are prone to sour rot infection. So for ice wine, using ice wine juice upwards of 38 to 40 bricks, CN1 uh, only produces about 8 to 9% volume per volume ethanol, but it reduces acetic acid by about 30% in comparison to ec 1 a In the impassamental wines, CN1 ferments the juice up to 27 and a half bricks, and it can ferment it to dryness up, up at that level, producing wines with greater than 14% volume per volume ethanol. It produces less acetic acid and ethyl acetate in wine in comparison to EC1318 over a range of starting bricks in the juice. So it can reduce the acetic acid by 30 to 60% and um, the ethyl acetate by 30 to 35% in comparison to the commercial yeast. The sour rot grapes uh, for red wine, CN1 reduced acetic acid dropping, um, uh, sorry, during the fermentation uh, and dropping that level by 85%. Uh, so reducing the acetic acid from 0.45 grams per liter to only 0.7 grams per liter, 0.07 grams per liter in the final wine. In the sour rot grapes uh, used for the sparkling base wine production, CN1 fermented uh, the Pinot Noir juice used for sparkling wine production to dryness, but it required about four more days to go to dryness in comparison to the commercial yeast. However, during that time, it reduced the acetic acid uh, by 80%, dropping it from 0.25 grams per liter down to 0.05 grams per liter. Uh, the CN1 also did not add any acetic acid into the control base wine when it had no sour rot infection. 
So the amount of acetic acid in the wine equaled the amount that was present in the starving juice. So that's the end of my talk. Uh, there's a lot of people that I would like to uh, acknowledge uh, uh, throughout this journey of characterizing the Saccharomyces biennis yeast. Uh, the postdoctoral fellows that have worked on this, uh, Dr. Janan Nerville, Dr. Eileen Bay, and Dr. Jennifer uh, Kelly. Uh, graduate and fourth year students, uh, Jamie Kwai, Shiri Saude, uh, Jamie and Shiri uh, did the, the work on the yeast identification and then Jamie carried out some of those fermentations. Caitlin Height, that did her Bachelor of Science and then went on to get a Master's of Science degree. Uh, Jennifer Kelly, who got her PhD on those Passamento uh, fermentations. Robert um, Ali, who's still uh, with me right now, and Xiao uh, Lining, uh, who uh, had just started with us in the fall. Uh, research collaborators, uh, Dr. Gary Pickering and Dr. Linda Kemp. And of course, our technical assistants uh, that, that uh, carry out a lot of analysis for us, Fei Yang, Sufin Zhu, Lisa Dowling, and Rachel uh, Garbar. And of course, I'd be remiss if I didn't acknowledge uh, the funding agencies that have funded this research over the years. Uh, so there were two different uh, NSERC uh, funding programs, the Strategic and my uh, Discovery Grant. Uh, the Ontario Research Fund Research Excellence uh, Program, uh, the newer uh, uh, funding from the Canadian Grape Wine Certification Network for the AAFC-funded National Grape and Wine Cluster, uh, Ontario Grape and Wine Research Inc., and then, of course, industry partners at uh, Pilateri Estates Winery and uh, Lamont. So uh, with that, uh, <laughs> if there's any questions, uh, uh, please feel free to ask. And yes, this is uh, me in my vineyard uh, a few years ago now. Uh, my goodness, that was 10 years ago in 2010 uh, when I got the Great King title for Ontario. So uh, uh, I'm uh, happy to entertain questions. Andre. <laughs> so I know you work with fresh culture and the activity. Yeah. Like, so uh, with the dehydration process, uh, the yeast are, are grown up in a way that it, um, at least for Saccharomyces cerevisiae, we have to see if the Bionis yeast will respond to this, but they're grown up in a way that uh, uh, the membranes of the yeast are, are um, uh, fortified so that when they go through the dehydration process of losing water, um, the membranes don't get damaged. And so when the water gets added back in, uh, we have a, a higher viability of cells through that rehydration process. Um, so there's a, a, a sugar compound known as trailose that is really critical in that dehydration process. We'll have to see if the Saccharomyces vianus strain responds the same way. Um, but what that means with a, a dehydrated yeast, when the yeast are getting rehydrated, you can add um, micronutrients to the rehydration water that are vitamins and minerals and sterols that will give the yeast a, a better um, ability to withstand really stressful conditions during fermentation. So typically with um, uh, commercial yeast, we're able to use all of those micronutrients to help give the yeast a boost. When you're working with yeast from liquid culture, um, it's much harder to get those micronutrients inside the cell. Uh, because you're always growing them in media. The media can bind up um, those components. So, uh, uh, you know, they may not get the added benefit of, um, of being able to supplement with those compounds. However, the dehydrated yeast go through that dehydration process, and uh, there is some cell viability issues, uh, you know, upon rehydration that we would not have occurring with the culture yeast. So, I'm, I'm really anxious to, to see if we can get a dehydrated culture of this yeast so that we can start to do those comparisons. Any other questions? So, you know, I always ask about the methodology question. Yeah. So, the sour rock point. Yeah. Um, we know that the sour rock is in itself because of the 
uh, unwanted bacteria and unwanted yeast other than that. Yeah. So is there any attempt to made to look what is there before starting those experiments? So we have done those studies. Um, I didn't do them for, for these experiments, but I did do those studies with Wendy McFadden-Smith when we were looking at the etiology of the Sour Rock Complex and identifying uh, some of the natural yeast and bacteria that are part of that complex. So here we've got Hansenia spora uvarum or Clucker apiculata that we saw, you know, we, we had also isolated from ice wine grapes. It's, it's ubiquitous in, in all grapes. So um, that wasn't surprising to see. Uh, we also have acetic acid bacteria. And um, in addition, there's some candida yeast uh, that, that we isolated in that complex. So how those, um, how that ecology will change through the course of fermentation with Bianis, uh, we haven't um, <laughs> looked at all of those other yeast um, attributes or those yeast colonies. Uh, and bacterial colonies through the course of, of these ferments. But we did um, follow the Saccharomyces biennis yeast. So we were inoculating at a very high concentration, like at, uh, about two times 10 to the six cells per ml, which is uh, the typical concentration that we inoculate uh, with commercial yeast when we add them to a fermentation. So the yeast are inoculated at a much higher concentration than any of the sour rock complex organisms would be even in that that really concentrated uh, sour rock juice. So uh, good question, uh, maybe another project down the road. Uh, this uh, this initial project, uh, we just wanted to see what the impact would be of the Vianis yeast and based on the positive results that we got, um, I think there's uh, much more work that, that we can do. But it'll be a lot easier if we can get a, a, a dehydrated form of the yeast going. All right, well, if there's no more questions, uh, I do want to announce that uh, next week on February 3rd, uh, Jeff Stewart, who is a Covey Fellow here um, uh, at Covey and Associate Professor in Biological Sciences, will be giving a talk on the development and commercial, commercial scaling of green extraction methods for polyphenols from winter grape pumice. So, uh, lots of um, important polyphenolic compounds uh, present in grapes, so I'm sure this is going to be a very interesting talk. So uh, I look forward to seeing everybody uh, next Monday for that. Thank you. Thank you.